I am very excited to bring up our next uh, panel on recommendations and priorities for today's market. This is sponsored by our friends at FGMC and hosted by the man, the myth, the legend, Rob Chrisman coming up right here. We're gonna ask Steve Pulowski, Pat Peters, Amy Creason, and Phil Rosori to all join us. And if Phil's not in here, I'll vamp more. Where is Phil? Is he really not in here? Somebody get Phil. Come on up, please. Grab a seat. We didn't say what Phil would say. Phil's just, he's just eye candy anyways for these guys. We know it. Hey, Rob, how about that guy, Chris Anderson? I hear he's doing a pretty good job, huh? Are you uh, an announcer for Mexican soccer, by the way? I am. Viva <laughs> Asa! Let's go. Uh, we're, we're also missing Steve. Yeah, so Steve and Phil were out at the Bloody Mary bar. They're on their way up now, though. So once again, let's put a hand together for our wonderful panelist, our on-time panelist. <laughs> this is going to be a great one, folks. All right. Thank you for uh, sticking around here. It is Women's History Month, and I would like to point that out. So <laughs> we are representing Women's History Month. That is right. Thank goodness. So we've got till 11.45? Rob fills up there with you. Take as much time as you want, sir. <laughs> All right. You know, uh, Chris, I'm, I'll address this to you. <clears throat> so thank you for having me moderate a panel. If you've ever gotten a, 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 um, a meal at McDonald's, you know, you have your cheeseburger, and you have your french fries, and your soda pop, but then you look in the bottom of the bag, and there's that one fry you missed, and how happy you feel, like, oh, I got that one extra fry. That's how I felt finding out what, that Phil was on our panel today. I was like, oh, <laughs> Phil is on our panel. It's like getting that extra French fry at the bottom of the bag. Who doesn't love French fries? That's right, that's right. All right, uh, so we are here to talk about the uh, uh, following up on the MSR discussion, which is very exciting. Uh, the agency discussion and also the aggregator discussion. We've got Pat here from Fannie Mae, uh, or I'm sorry, from Wells Fargo, oops. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit, and I'm going to have the panelists introduce themselves, but I wanted to keep things in perspective because I'm a big person ab about perspective. And if you look at, well, and, uh, let's see, Wells Fargo was founded in 1852, Fannie Mae in 1938, and Freddie Mac in 1970. So that's over 300 years of collective loan experience here. And when you look back at 2008, 2012, 2020, if you think about three institutions that kept buying loans when, say, non-QM lenders or investors did not, private label security uh, types did not, these three kept buying loans. And I think that's very important for people here in the crowd to remember and keep things in perspective. So we're gonna start at the end with Steve, like a couple of a, a minute or two uh, to tell the crowd about yourself. So uh, Steve Pulowski, uh, Fannie Mae, um, and I didn't realize you worked at Fannie Mae too. So. Sorry, no. sorry. New employee. Um, been with Fannie Mae for 31 years. I've uh, done everything from uh, strategy to servicing to capital markets uh, to strategy initiatives. I'm right now uh, head of uh, product and solutions for a single family where I manage all our strategic initiatives and product uh, solutions for our business partners uh, and work with uh, digital alliances where we work very closely with MCT to help drive some of our capabilities and services out to the marketplace. Pat? Good morning. Uh, Pat Peters with Wells Fargo. I've been with Wells Fargo for more than 20 years and have done many things from uh, project management to strategy, and now I am business to business relationship manager for fintech companies, including hedge advisory firms, product pricing engines, and Abitte platforms. Hi, everyone. Uh, Amy Creason with Freddie Mac. I've been with Freddie Mac since 2017. Prior to that, I was in the uh, secondary marketing space, uh, sitting in your seat uh, for about 20 plus years, although we don't want to admit how many years it has been and how the world has changed. So when I see all these great things that you guys have created, and I think back to my um, Excel spreadsheets, and that's all I had, um, it makes me just a little bit better that uh, 
I peaked too, too early. But um, <laughs> what I've been uh, also in consulting, so helping mortgage bankers, secondary marketing folks uh, optimize their executions, set up their secondary groups, uh, recruit. And um, so I manage currently at Freddie Mac a group of folks who uh, cover much like uh, like these guys cover our partners in the industry. So it's an ecosystem to get us all efficient and effective. And one part of it, of course, is a very important part of it is folks like MCT, so product and pricing engines, interest rate risk management platforms, whole loan trading platforms, as well. So we're glad to be here and having conversations about what's next. And Phil. Awesome. Well, I'll swap my inter introduction since I already had one. Um, just to echo Rob's comments, you know, I, th I think that was great. I, I think we probably should have. We were probably a little remiss in our in our in our kind of uh, overview to probably not uh, uh, say thank you and, uh, and and yeah to the agencies to keep the you know keep everything going since you know since '07 basically, and then Wells Fargo. Um, you know, it's actually coming of age to finally get John Kerrigan here at our uh, at our at our exchange. But um, you know, in 2012, they really did carry um, the you know the the industry from a from a correspondent perspective. So I think all of us, including you know those of you that are competitors with Wells, I, I, I think can uh, have them to thank for for getting us through 2012. Yeah, I agree. So <clears throat> we had a. Uh, Preliminary, we've had some preliminary emails and discussions and so forth. So uh, we are dealing with publicly held companies, uh, Fannie and Freddie, obviously under conservatorship. So they're, they're I'm limited in terms of the questions that I can ask and not ask and so forth. So I'll start with Amy or Steve. How much do you guys expect to earn next quarter? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, just the right amount. We'll start with a big picture here. And for years, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac approval has been a uh, you know a m m milestone, something a lot of lenders shoot for. They they kind of start with the lower tier of investors and work their way up. And having a ticket is a big deal. Is it still a big deal? I, I, Amy, I'll start with you, and then Steve, you could chime in if you like. But is it still a big deal? And are there tips that you would give anybody here in the crowd? in terms of being approved and, and what that entails. Right. Well, uh, it might be a little self-serving, but sure, it's a big deal. Um, it's just as uh, being approved with any investor or number of investors is. Uh, the requirements for approval with the GSEs uh, might differ from your other investors. The uh, requirements of your ongoing participation with the GSEs might be a little bit different than other, with other investors. But the GSEs are here to provide stability and liquidity in the mortgage marketplace. And part of that is offering lots of different programs, so not only um, uh, the types of programs, um, but also the methodologies for sales. So retained and released, we've just heard several conversations here about uh, the benefits for um, retaining as well as those needs for releasing. And uh, as a consequence, then, when you're making application to the GSEs, I, I hope you'll reflect, uh, first of all, is it the right time? Um, is my company in a, in a state where I can go through this process? It's fairly rigorous. Uh, rigorous because we manage risk holistically, and um, the uh, events of the past couple of years certainly have in introduced a uh, different type of risk for us. Look at home price appreciation. So you've seen some changes that the GSEs have made um, more recently in uh, reaction to a $100,000 uh, over you know one year of price appreciation it, uh, of the uh, conforming loan size. So um, the probably the biggest tip I would have for you is to, uh, honest self-reflection. Is this right for you? Um, may not be right for you right now, so start planning then if you think that your strategy is such that uh, your acquisition of a company or merging or changing your, your uh, channels, uh, your production channels, might then merit um, an introduction then to a, to a GC, GSC application and get the help that you might need. Um, lots, of, lots of that help out here in the industry. Steve? I, I, you know, I think you summed it up pretty well. What I, about self reflection I think is really key because there's two channels, right? There's the whole loan uh, channel and there's the MBS. Uh, and the MBS channel has uh, a number of layers, complexity to it. Uh, there's uh, a number of things you have to be thinking about when you think about execution, which MCT can definitely help out with. Uh, but it's a, it's a much more, I think, uh, a little bit more complex. It's not as straightforward. 
And then also it's a schedule schedule type of servicing remittance. So if you're looking to retain servicing, uh, schedule schedule also brings some complexity with it as well. On the whole loan side, a little straightforward. It's an actual actual, which means that you're, whatever you receive from the borrower, you're, you're passing on versus the schedule schedule. And it's a little, a little straightforward. It, you can hedge through the cash window or the whole loan desk, uh, 30, 60, 90 days, do best efforts. So it's much more uh, convenient for a small lender who's probably dipping their toes into the water with a, fan, with a GSE. Uh, so I think that's really, I, I think, the key point. And then just making sure, it's, you know, it's the time right. You know, we do have net worth requirements that you have to, you have to, uh, to marry up to. Uh, but other than that, I, I think uh, having a GSC uh, as, uh, as an outlet is always a good thing, not a bad thing. Good answer. So, Pat, following up with that, assuming that Freddie and Fannie stay on their same path, what role do aggregators, and I know you work for Wells Fargo, but I mean, if you could speak for other aggregators as well, what role do aggregators play in this landscape? Well, I think we provide yet another option, right? So as a lender, having minimum 12, 16 different options for all of the production that you and your loan officers are bringing in is key to your success using MCT, all of their technology, their services, and their team to help you, know, to help you maintain margin, really uh, manage the pipeline to the best of your ability, especially in uh, 2022, because it certainly will get uh, harder before it gets easier, uh, given the market. Yeah. So I'm gonna, next question I'm going to direct to Phil. Um, in terms of execution that lenders should look for. And, and I think that options are very, very good. In fact, when companies ask me about, gee, should I get approved with Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac? And I'll say, yeah, I mean, that's a goal because that's a, an option. It gives you an option that a lot of your smaller competitors may not have. Maybe you're competing with you know, Phil and Rob's mortgage and we can't get agency approval. And if you can get agency approval, you can, you can do some things that Phil and Rob's mortgage might not be able to do. So Phil, in terms of uh, a lender looking at best execution, what goes through the mind of, of MCT's clients in terms of, have you ever, let me ask you slightly differently, have you ever had a client that says, I don't want to get approved with Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, or is, or is that the goal because of the optionality? Yeah, that's a great question, you know, and, and <clears throat> I would say probably up until, until March of 2020, um, we, we had a lot of customers that just from a, you know, just from a enterprise standpoint didn't want to retain for a variety of reasons. And because they didn't want to retain, you know, obviously there, there's been the co-issue executions out there and a lot of innovation by both, the, both your organizations in that, uh, in that space. But if you don't want to retain, there is this thought that, okay, you know, I can, you know, stay with just aggregator execution. And we, we definitely had clients that were on with us, you know, upwards of a decade and, ne and never get approved with the agencies. I think that uh, we're, when the liquidity crunch happened in that, in that, in that decoupling, you know, that, that occurred for luckily a short period of time in the beginning of 2020, that, that changed our mindset. I think, um, you know, Curtis and I realized that uh, it, it's really only responsible of us as we, as we are bringing uh, you guys from what you have perceived in the past as a risk-free endeavor of that best efforts lock to to now you know becoming your own investor during that lock period until that loans funded uh, it, it's it's you know we're remiss if we are not uh, continually trying to push that track of agency approval with with all that said um, our our best executing clients, and we've got a couple larger customers in here that probably won't agree, you know, or won't be happy with this. But the bottom line is the best execution, the best executing client, you know, has basically all three options. And the three options would be aggregator best ex execution, um, you know, your, your SMP or cash released exchange flow co issue execution, which we think, you know, the, on the co issue side is the future. And then, of course, your retained. You know, bulk life of uh, portfolio, or or bulk sell it off with uh, sheriffs and and Azad and company over uh, over there. But I I, I think those are, those are really your options. And 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 for our clients, it's just empirically you know 
proven that those customers that are executing on all three of those platforms are going to execute best. Good. I'm going to ask this about of Steve. So <clears throat> the Biden administration comes in. No, I'm not going to ask anybody, you know, who voted for who. But the Biden administration comes in. Actually, every administration, we hear about affordable housing. We talk about first-time home buyers and so forth. So it's kind of a mantra, mantra. But as the agencies have, have moved through history and moved through the Trump administration, now the Biden administration, you know, the, the thing is affordable housing, first-time home buyers and so forth. And, and both agencies have been dealing with the credit issues and the credit box expanding, contracting, and so forth. Um, what is, what is, what are you guys doing in terms of affordable housing? Because everybody wants to do more affordable housing loans. What are you guys doing for first-time home buyers? Because everybody wants to do more first-time home buyer loans. Yep. So what's going on in the, in the hallways? Uh, Rob, thanks for the question. I, you know, to your point, um, we've always been mission focused. I mean, that's why the GSEs were established. And, and it's interesting because, uh, you know, we were very focused on getting out of conservatorship, as you know, and then the administration changed hands. And uh, the focus really is on affordability, uh, racial equity, uh, low the moderate income bars. And back in 2021, we kind of made the switch over where we were always mission oriented, but we wanted to make sure we had the emphasis on it because um, one, our purpose is for first time home buyers and, and low to moderate income borrowers. So we really started to focus a lot on mission initiatives. Uh, and you know, one of the big things that came out of that was uh, the rental payment uh, program that we have. So this is where uh, homeowner or first time home buyers who uh, maybe have thin credit uh, but have been making uh, 12 consecutive uh, monthly mortgage payments. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to uh, pull that in through uh, the VOA uh, asset electronically, uh, which is part of our DVS program that we have, but where we'll identify within the VOA or within the asset report whether the borrowers made 12 month uh, uh, consecutive uh, payments. Uh, in that case, we can take some, that's the difference between being not qualified versus qualified for, for a mortgage. And that's a, that's a really big deal because, uh, you know, one of the things that we're working with, um, you know, with the credit bureaus and, and uh, the uh, project managers about reporting rent payment because we do think it's really beneficial, especially as we think about thin credit borrowers, first time home buyers, and low to moderate income borrowers. But that's really been a, a really big program for us, a big push. We rolled that out in September of last year. Uh, and we continue to work with our vendor partners uh, and our lenders to make sure they have the capabilities to be able to pull that, that data electronically through their vendor into DU, and then we'll make that part of our overall risk assessment. The other thing that uh, I think is a really big deal too is we rolled out HomeView um, in the last couple months, and that's really, uh, I, I really like this program because it really gets to the heart of, the, of what we're really trying to do is educate uh, borrowers, right? Uh, HomeView is really um, a really inactive, uh, interactive, comprehensive, you know, I think, uh, tool or courses that really educate borrowers on what it means to be a homeowner. Uh, it's about, I think, seven modules uh, that go through, hey, how do I qualify for a mortgage? Am I ready to get a mortgage? What does that look like? Uh, what does responsibility of homeownership really mean? Um, and really gets the sense of the bar, are you ready uh, and are you prepared? Uh, and what's really nice about that, it's a free tool, um, and it meets uh, the national industry standards for pre-purchase uh, homeowner uh, education. So I think it's a really key, key tool that we're hoping lenders will use to really get the bars to come in and make sure that as they enter into this process, they're ready for it, and, they're, and it creates a better bar experience overall. The other things, too, that I think are, are just general programs uh, that we've had out in the marketplace for some time, like Home Ready. I don't know if people are familiar with that, but this is a low, moderate income borrower program. I think it's 80% uh, AMI or, or less. But that's a really key program because that's 97% LTV or 3% down. And what's really interesting too is, uh, I'm sure you guys were you know, down payment assistance, but we do allow a borrower uh, to take that 3% and use other funds uh, at the closing table to be able to, to meet uh, the 97% LTV. That's a really big deal if you're trying to really uh, focus on first-time home buyers, low, moderate-income borrowers, these are really good programs to put out there 
uh, within your product base uh, to really attract the right bars. And then MH Advantage is another uh, big one that we, we've been pushing to, and especially with uh, affordable housing, you know, the shortage of it, right? Manufactured housing is a really good alternative uh, for first time home buyers. Uh, and that's a really, uh, that's also a 97% LTV program that really enables uh, you to reach that first time home buyer and put them into uh, a position where they can be successful and be qualified for a home mortgage. So I think those are really the four big things. I mean, there's a lot of programs. If you go to Fannie Mae's website, trust me, you, there's a, 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 it'll put you to sleep. But there's a lot of good information uh, on our website as far as all the low mod income first time home buyer programs. So. Amy? Brady Mac. Well, uh, uh, Steve did an excellent job explaining <laughs> um, pretty much <laughs> The, the uh, effort of the GSEs. And so Freddie Mac, similarly, um, uh, home buyer education, uh, similar products, um, focusing on also the fact that we're still, while rates have crept up, we're still in a lower rate environment. So there are opportunities for folks who need to refinance. They should refinance. And that messaging, getting out to folks and using the right vehicles for that message is also a focus. Um, looking at renovation uh, loans. So um, uh, that's a great opportunity for folks who need to make modifications to their homes, but perhaps their credit or their perception of their credit is, um, is, is disadvantaged. And then in the purchase space, uh, utilizing our programs for low to uh, mid-income folks allows for you guys on the secondary side to still have more product to manage, but it's the key is looking further upstream right in the process so that you don't elongate your risk period for hedging. Um, and that means employment of all the tools that come along with these products. And uh, from a technology standpoint, the investment that the GSEs have made in, um, in providing that uh, less or creating less friction in the origination process, working with our partners. Um, again, back to the ecosystem. We are all connected, um, uh, competitors and partners. And um, whether, you know, whether you thought about that 10 years ago, that that was going to be the case or not, here we are. And working with the, finding the right partners, but also vetting those partners to ensure, remember this is, we, we got a lot of business here that we're supporting, is we want to ensure that our partners are ready for the task and can deliver uh, for the benefit of our borrowers. But to Steve's point, if you want to come over to freddymac.com and take a look at all of our cool stuff, uh, I invite you to do so. But there's some fantastic training material that maybe folks in secondary wouldn't traditionally uh, bother to take a look at. Uh, you might be impressed about inter how interactive it is and um, and you can see the messaging so that you can work with your operations and your loan origination folks uh, in concert together to create more product yeah I mean that's a good point too I mean on both websites there's tons of information and it's really good information but there's purchase money products there's refi now which is a good refi product and then there's home improvement products and things like that so there's a lot of things that did, when we talk about being GSE uh, as, a, as a lender uh, and us as an investor, that's one of the benefits, right, is all these programs that we put out there to help you reach your borrower in a way that can help you be successful and make sure that you're qualifying the bar and sustainable home ownership. So Pat, I'm gonna come back to you and you can think about Wells Fargo's offering. Phil, I'm gonna come back to you and go off script because I think every independent mortgage banker here uh, is, uh, if they're not, they should be paying attention to CRA developments around the nation in different states. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about CRA in a second with you, but Pat, I wanted to ask you in terms of Wells Fargo, we heard from Steve, we heard from Amy, in terms of the you know, affordable housing, first time home buyer kind of thing. What should folks here expect, say, from Wells Fargo in terms of product offerings? Great question, and if you don't want to go to the dot coms on both of my sides. <laughs> We're all friends here, Friend, frenemies, frenemies. Um, well, Spargo actually does co-hosting with each of the agencies on these products. So if you don't want to read or you actually want to take advantage of training that's been created for you, that your loan officers can take advantage of, sign up. Um, Wells Fargo is one of the, one of the co-authors or co-hosting as well. So do a plug for that. You can skip the .com piece of it. Uh, for CRA and LMI, um, as a bank, we have very specific requirements. We have incentives that we do pay. We work 
obviously with MCT on the back end to make sure what we're coming up with is actually translatable and transactionable in the industry. So we're in advance calling these great experts and saying, all right, this is what we want to do. Is it possible? And um, the technology is fantastic. It is always possible. Things that we've seen in the industry, and I work with product pricing engines as well, over the last six years, the product pricing engines are actually making progress in figuring out how to get the CRA incentive to the f closer to the borrower. So there are steps going on. There's technology changes happening. And if you are using and uh, outsourcing your PPE, I'd reach out to them and ask them, where are you with the CRA capability? What can you do uh, to help us make sure that that incentive gets closer and closer to the borrower. Because I think ultimately, the borrower is, should be the benefit. Altruistic goal, of course. But um, if the borrower is able to participate, think about the re reputation that you as a lender would have if you were able to get the word out that they can share in the uh, prosperity. Good. So a <clears throat> little bit of a history lesson here. I've got to put on my old, old dinosaur hat. So. Back when I was running capital markets, toward the end of every year, we would get notified by the banks, hey, we need CRA loans. We need, you know, send them our way, we'll pay you half a point or a point. And so every day we'd get the, the funded loans and we'd go through and figure out which loan was in which county, and which state, and, and oh, let's sell that to City or that to Wells Fargo and so forth. The CRA, uh, Community Reinvestment Act issue, which banks are very, very familiar with, but it's a huge issue, and I'm on the, on the board of the California MBA, and it's a huge issue in terms of California. Our CRA requirements going to be applied to independent mortgage banks, and that is already going on in places like Massachusetts. Uh, so, Phil, I wanted to ask you, given that the CRA, especially in terms of independent mortgage banks, is becoming more of an issue, um, and I know I'm putting you on the spot. We, this is not rehearsed. Uh, <laughs> So what, what, is, what is MCT? What if you have a client ask you, what are you guys doing about CRA pricing in terms of hedging, in terms of risk? I mean, what, what, is, what is MCT doing? Yeah, well, we, um, look, look, got to give credit to Pat and Wells. They've definitely been a leader in the CRA space. And as, as Pat had said, probably for eight years now, we've worked together on them culling through our pipeline. About uh, six years ago, we made a geocoder. Uh, so, so we have all the census tracts, all of your property addresses geocoded uh, to those census tracts, obviously, and we can match the income to the AMI levels of the, of the, of, of the MSA. Um, so there's, there, there's a lot to be done there, as Pat said. I mean, it's, there's no question that, especially with CRA, considering what it's meant to do, it should go down to the borrower. Uh, right now, it does not. I mean, there is a, you know, there's a lot of buyers out there loan buyers that will hold these loans. And then as Rob said, there's community banks kind of throughout the country that come December, you know, are desperately need to, to buy these loans. And so that's, a, that, that's an inefficient market. Um, and so we do think that through some of the stuff Justin talked about uh, with the pipeline transparency and allowing banks to go in um, and, and view, these, view these loans early on, and potentially, you know, if they're in certain census tracts, and especially in in California, income levels, because it's it's hard to get there on a lot of on with given property values, um, you know, to to give the buyer the ability to basically take that loan off the table because they 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 need that specific census tract. So there's a lot of efficiencies uh, to be done with, you know, to be done there. And w w which we're really excited about, and then CRA just in general. I think it was again, Amy and Steve. We can't get the, we can't ask for their opinions on this. Um, but with FHFA, you know, the latest announcement. I think we we did a, you know, we made a pretty big deal of it. Although there's granted, there's not a whole lot of scenarios outside of maybe the Bay Area in Northern California that this applies to. But but you guys all saw that those new high balance adjustments. You know, they they they. They don't. They're not applicable if it's a first-time home buyer, and, and and the income is less than or equal to 100% of AMI. And I think that's 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 a huge change. You know that that's an FHFA directive, uh, LLPA, which has to. That's how LLPAs 
uh, have to be changed. And, and that's basically introducing CRA into, uh, into an LLPA calculation. So I think, again, we can't ask their opinions on where they think this is going, but that seems to be very consistent with what they've talked about, very consistent with the new regime at FHFA. Um, and so I think we could see more of that to come. So it's not, you know, it's not just necessarily a, a bank question. It's also, you know, a mortgage banker question. Good. <clears throat> Another topic I'm hearing about out there and that I'm sure in, impacts everybody here is good old margin compression. Uh, volumes dropping, margins compression. We're not going to talk about particular companies, especially on the wholesale level, that uh, uh, are, are dealing with uh, margin compression. But I wanted to start with you, Amy, in terms of, uh, you know, what are you seeing your clients do to not necessarily combat margin compression, but, I mean, let's face it, we've, you, you, take the, you take an MBS price and you add the servicing and you get to a certain level, which is about the same level for everybody else. And I will argue that the survival of the fittest are the ones who can, you know, produce a loan, manufacture a loan at the lowest cost because that that sales price is kind of capped out. So, what do you, what is Freddie Mac doing in terms of the uh, technology that helps lenders become more efficient, and how can clients con deal with Freddie Mac and learn about what you are offering? Well, Rob, you were talking about your dinosaur hat, and I've got one of those. I'm going to pop it on for just a second. My, um, my first uh, mentor when I got into the business, I was so proud of myself. I had um, put, uh, put together the mark to market, and we were looking really profitable. And it had been one of those good times. And uh, so he says, well, even a well-trained pet monkey can make a dollar in a good market. And so uh, that was, you know, <laughs> that was the beginning of the education. Um, so it, it's been some good times for the market more uh, over the last couple of years. Now it's back to crunch time. So what were you paying attention to as a secondary marketing manager? Uh, were you doing in-depth analysis? Um, were you utilizing your tools that you have at your disposal to monitor uh, how your business changed? Did you, do you have a new concentration? Is your forecasting up to date? So all of those things that you guys are doing on your side, you need to marry with what we're doing on the, on the investor side. Um, we provide all kinds of business intelligence tools for you guys to, um, to, to reconcile and validate. But uh, in addition to, and I mentioned it earlier, it's that entire process, the origination through sale and servicing um, that, that you guys will obviously be t paying great attention to. Um, the technology has allowed you guys, hopefully, to reallocate some of your human, a human resources, right, your human assets, to dive in deep to review data, to look at uh, analysis, as opposed to sitting there and banging on a, on a system, right? I've got to be in this investor system, and this investor system, and this investor system. Now you have all the, the great heavy lifting being done through automation. But what are the risks that come with that? That you might take your eye off of what your pipeline looks like? That you might not know who's in that pipeline? Uh, that you might not understand that your company has uh, changed some of its operational expense and now it's concentrated in different areas. So um, over on the GSE side, so I'll take my dinosaur hat off. Um, all of those things still uh, apply, but on the GSE side, we've been able to increase partnerships with folks like MCT, product and pricing engines, um, on the POS side, on the LOS side, to help you create those efficiencies. Um, we've employed a variety of different tools. I won't use all the acronyms um, because we boy do we have them <laughs> collectively between us, but through various tools um, in the front, in the middle, at the end, we are creating efficiencies for you. So can you harness those efficiencies? Can you quantify those efficiencies and put them into your best execution model so that you can look at that price compression, uh, that margin compression? Uh, is it, um, do you have leakage in your pipeline? What can you look at from an execution standpoint if you, for example, are looking at Freddie Mac's cash release exchange program? Within the cash release exchange program, not only can you communicate with us electronically to uh, get pricing, to take out commitments, um, I think we um, collectively, between Freddie and MCT, we had about 
uh, 35-ish billion maybe, and about 62, 63,000 transactions that came through electronically last year. Uh, that's a lot of cost savings. That's a lot of efficiency. And then with cash release exchange program in particular, MCT clients are able to, to utilize our, uh, give you another acronym, FAST, um, Freddie Automated Servicing Transfer. So now that servicing piece, that servicing transfer portion that had been a cost um, for a human to go in and do a whole bunch of stuff is now automated. And so the machines are doing the heavy lifting uh, for us. So looking for each one of those opportunities within the, with the GSEs and, uh, you know, to coin a, to take the term from the 70s, right, we've come a long way, baby, yep. um, <laughs> from what we, what we used to offer. Uh, you do have these opportunities. It's yours to analyze and ensure that you incorporate. Steve? Yeah, yeah, listen, I mean, the market's getting tight. Uh, one way to combat, you know, uh, the uh, decrease in, in gain on sale or gross margin is cost, right? How do you take cost out of the, out of the process? Um, and, you know, to Amy's point, I mean, the GSEs have been on this road for five to six years uh, as far as looking at how do you digitize this mortgage process from uh, end to end, right, from application to closing to delivery. That, that's key, right? It's how do you pull that cost out? And really with the with technology and digitization of data, it's you're, you're able to do it. Uh, we, you know, I, I talked a little bit about DVS, which is uh, data validation service, right? It carries day one certainty with it. But the p point of the digitization is that instead of, um, you're able to pull assets and income and employment information electronically, right? Uh, we're able to validate that immediately within the DU application system. Uh, and Freddie's able to do the same. Uh, and we're able to give you day one certainty on it. Well, what, what happens then is you're taking, I'll give you an example, like uh, I think the val validation of assets takes about 12, takes 12 days out of the cycle time, right? The allocation of uh, income and assets probably takes another eight to 10 days out of the process. So that's, that's a really big, deal, right? Because you're taking that cost out and, you're, and people are then have the time to go and do the things they need to do around exceptions. Um, two is, uh, you know, I think the other, the other big thing is, uh, and, and uh, Phil mentioned a little bit, servicing marketplace, right? That, that's really, when you enter these tight times, what you're running into now is if you're holding servicing one time, now you've got to make an execution decision. Do I retain or sell, right? Do I, on a, do I start to sell on a co-issue basis? And servicing marketplace gives you the capability to go and span across a number of different servicing buyers at one time and really maximize your execution, uh, which is a, a tool that uh, we've embedded very well with uh, MCT. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing I'll point out is um, you know, um, e-mortgage. Right, uh, I, I, you know, I think with the pandemic, uh, we've really hit that point where uh, I, I know I'm sure Freddie's seen the same thing we have. I mean, the number of lenders coming through that want to get approved for e mortgage uh, has tripled in the last year and a half. Right, I, and part of the reason they're doing that is because they are trying to take costs out of their system. The beauty with e mortgage, though, it, is it's still like. If you go and look at where we are today versus, I've been in, I, I had a mortgage 20 years ago, um, and I think it was like, and for 20 years it never changed. It was the same people, this, you know, it was 2% of your overall deliveries, that was it. And then 2020 came around and all of a sudden the light went off and everybody said, and they're like, we gotta digitize our, our mortgage process. And, but the problem with the mortgage, a fully mortgage process is that it's still fragmented. Uh, while we've seen warehouse lenders and investors and technology solution providers out there really building the capabilities out, it's still a fragmented ecosystem, if you will. So what we're educating people on is uh, hybrid e-closing, right? That's where you're signing some of the docs electronically and then some of the docs are uh, being signed in front of a closing agent. But the beauty of that is keeping, making e-notes part of that process. And the reason why I say that is when we talk about um, you know, lowering costs and being more efficient. Well, if you have an e-note, right, what does that mean? Well, it means the warehouse lender uh, can certify that loan a lot faster. So it means that you're managing your warehouse lines a lot better. You deliver to, you deliver to GSEs, it's pretty much a lights out process because there's no custodian involved. I, I, you deliver the e-note to me, I compare it to loan delivery, I certify it right away, I fund you within 24, 48 hours, 
right? So now you manage your warehouse line, you've gotten your funding within 24, 48 hours. Uh, that's a big deal, uh, especially in this type of market. So th those are the kind of things that I think, you know, like you said, knowing your pipeline and knowing where you are and execution is really a big part of that, but behind the scenes, you gotta take costs out of that process. And I think there's tools within the GSE buckets that can really help you with that. As there probably are with the coach, so Pat, in terms of Wells Fargo and Wells Fargo's technology offering, what, what seems to be a hit out there among your, with, with the clientele? So Wells Fargo does have e-mortgages as well, and uh, we- That's why I brought it up. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, we actually are looking to approve at least four to five more, or four to five more times the number of clients from last year. So we are, we want the trend to go straight up as it relates to use of and being able to buy e-mortgages. We actually have e-mortgages for the non-conforming programs as well. And um, at this time, Ginny Mae is not, they, they haven't opened up their pilot yet, so we're not participating in that one. But when they do, we'll certainly uh, take it on. But that would be one piece of it. The other things I think about are, as I'm working with the various uh, hedge advisor firms and product pricing engines, is really understanding your delivery. So when you deliver to someone like Wells Fargo, Understand what are your suspense, suspense rate? Why is it that high? Is it a specific document? Is there, is there a process that isn't quite worked out? Um, understand your delivery time. Does it take you five days to send it to your aggregator or does it take you 15? And if it takes you 20, what is it about those loans where you're sitting on it for 20 days? What's, what's the process that's slowing it down? Because that's money, right? Every day that it sits in your pipeline, you're not funded. So. How do you streamline, streamline that process? The other thing I think about from a pricing perspective is really understand, does every loan, does it make sense to put every loan into mandatory? So really taking that ex execution and really pull it back. So I, I used to still say it, when you best X, we expect you to best X against Wells Fargo best effort, Wells Fargo mandatory, the agencies, uh, Penny Mac, Amerihome do all of us, because the goal here is to make sure that the loan goes to the right place for the right price. Wow, that's a great tagline. <laughs> the right place at the right price. I wrote that, is that Does your license plate <laughs> frame say that, Pat? Quick, do we have an attorney out there that can <laughs> <laughs> register that? So, Phil, I know that uh, like so much of today and tomorrow are gonna be spent talking about MCT technology. Um, in terms of what the panelists were talking about just now, in terms of the, the, the technology that's available to their clients and so forth, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously we focus on the uh, capital market side of, of, of all of the technology that they were talking about. And, um, um, but uh, specific to, to, to what Pat said on the best efforts versus mandatory execution, uh, um, you know, historically Wells Fargo, uh, had uh, had had differing uh, well actually in, I mean it's not it's no secret Pat because most most of these are your your clients you know had had differing SRP grids between best efforts and mandatory uh, some were a little stronger on the best effort side and then you've got a seven day best efforts and so to Pat's point um, absolutely true you know we're agnostic to where the loan actually executes to and that's why you know best effort executions are are always in the best you know always in the best execution along with retained with a you know MSR value SMP cash released exchange all of your all of your executions but um, but 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 no I think that uh, specifically to kind of what we were talking about earlier I, th I, th I, th I think we we expect to see more and more and I, I might be jumping the gun on a question now that I think about it but uh, we we expect to see more and more you know volume and, and products exciting stuff coming out of the aggregators like Wells Fargo um, in the in the you know higher end borrower as you know going back to that FHFA announcement you know, obviously the higher end borrower of the of the uh, high bow and the second home definitely got uh, got the short end of that stick. Uh, yeah. All right. So we've saved. We're not. I'm not not not, not going to go down the uh, high bow path here a little bit. But I, well, we saved about ten minutes for questions, <clears throat> and this is where an experienced moderator would have planted. 
questions, which I didn't do. Uh, so we've got the agencies up here. We've got Wells Fargo up here. Any questions that you would like to ask them uh, in terms of execution, in terms of how you find out about technology, about Fannie Mae's great bilingual uh, web page. I get a lot of comments about bilingual web page. Very, very good. Apparently very useful. First question right here, sir. Yes. Um, as far as eNotes are concerned, um, how many investors, I know that Wells does and everything, but you know, we are hearing, I'm with Warehouse Bank, so we're hearing from clients, they're not quite ready yet, there's some of the investors out there that are not ready yet to receive the eNotes. So what are you seeing, are, are you seeing a lot more investors starting to go on that path? And do you think that this will be completed by the end of 2022? Because there's not that, you know, there's probably a handful out there, but not everyone is taking the e-notes, and not every warehouse bank is funding them yet. Sure. Well, I, I'm going I'm to start on the smaller side. So okay. Freddie Mac does have, we do have clients, smaller clients, who have embraced e-notes and emphatically um, uh, done so. Uh, so um, uh, what's the trend? Well, I think we really have to talk to folks and understand where their investment allocations are going, right? That's the... Uh, people were a little busy, right, before. Um, and when you implement a program, as you guys well know, it's not just, uh, okay, let's do it. It is, there's expense, there's testing, um, there's plenty of, you know, what's the backup, uh, plenty of relationship management work that you have to do. So um, so I can't answer the question on, on who, what, when. I can tell you that in our cash release exchange program at Freddie Mac, so that's where we have uh, about nine servicers who do a blind auction. Um, so it's not co-issue. This is, in addition to co-issue, we have cash release exchange. And um, several of those servicing buyers as well are accepting e-notes. So, right, it's not just not just the investor of the whole loan. It's also potentially on the servicing side of your servicing. You're selling on a servicing release basis. I, I, I would say that. Uh, listen, I, I don't think we're going to flip from you know um, paper process to e-notes uh, at the end of 2022 or the end of 2023. I think the trend is moving in the right direction. Uh, I mean, we've gone from, you know, I'll, I'll make up numbers here, but our... I always do. I, I, I noticed that. I yeah. caught that, I caught that yeah. earlier. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I would say we tripled in volume in, in e-notes, right? Um, and in part, that's why I, I was talking about, we talk about e-mortgage, and when we, e-mortgage means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, I'm talking, and when we talk about hybrid, we're trying to say, listen, an e full e-mortgage process is a really big lift, right? But a hybrid process is a little bit easier. The technology's there uh, to really support, uh, you know, the e-notes. And there is benefits to the lender on the back end. Like, I, I was telling somebody the other day, we were talking about this, and I said, if you did a hybrid, I'm making this up, but... Rob, I'm making this up again. But I just want to people to know that. The crowd. But you may capture 80% of the value of having a, a, a digitized process or an e-mortgage through just the hybrid approach. Mm -hmm. um, and but the problem is it takes time, energy, and focus. Um, and we all know what happens in a cyclical market when we're when the when it gets really tight, right? We, we, don't, we forget to focus on the things that are process efficiencies because we're so worried about just trying to get the, the, the loans through the, the pipeline. Um, so, but the point is, what's really nice over the last, I'd probably say two to three years, the, the vendors have stepped up to the plate. Technology's there, the, um, uh, the loan processing platforms, the docu, the, the docs, uh, the e-vaults, MERS, it's all, it's all sitting there. You just got to piece it together. But I, bottom line is I think we're moving in the right direction. But I, I feel like I feel more positive than I did 15 years ago where it just seemed like you were just sitting in a lake and just paddling around and not going anywhere. I just feel like now we're, we are projecting the right way. But I, it's going to take time. all 
those pennies and nickels and dimes that we pick up, right? So, um, you know, maybe custodial fees go down, right? So as, as a result of, you know, less manhandling and, and shorter uh, times and, um, and you don't run into the backlog of everybody's rushed the door with refinances. Um, so it, it makes complete sense, right? We're all in violent agreement with one another. We need to do this. And then when somebody says, okay, make it so, uh, then it's like, oh, blah, 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 blah. I might need a little time, and where's my budget for this? And so the, so the age-old impl implementation problem. But I think we've seen the pricing pressure um, for those who have embraced more, even if it's on a hybrid basis, they're heading, they're, they're going to get to the, the um, end of the race faster. And that pricing pressure will change all kinds of hearts and minds, right? <laughs> We're going to do it now. We have to stay competitive. Yeah, somebody told me a couple of weeks ago about DocuSign. And normally, you know, up until a couple of weeks ago, I would run to the fax machine and, and do, get, the, get it before the paper curled up and sign it and fax it back. But somebody said, DocuSign, try that. And it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Anyway, <laughs> other questions? Oh. It's a transition. We're in transition. <laughs> Growing pains. <laughs> right. There you go. Well, I'll tell you, my refi I never got into debt faster um, because it was pure digital. And it was a little terrifying um, as someone who's been around and done a few <laughs> refis, where's the stack of paper and why, why is somebody not talking more about this to me? So maybe there are some, some thoughts there. Chris, is this the disco corner with the lights flicking? That's, that that's right? exactly right. I'll be dancing soon too. Here we go, one more. You know, I think the challenge I see, I, I closed my first D note way back with Ohio Savings back in the early 2000s. And we delivered everything to you guys and we programmed the e-vault and all that stuff. My question is, how do you overcome the challenge, me now as an aggregator, how do you overcome the challenge for convincing my seller partners to get the e-vault so we can do the e-vault to e-vault transfer so that we can deliver it back to you guys? Mm. Do you want to answer that one? No, I think, I think it's for you. <laughs> well, it's almost time for lunch. <laughs> I got to go. <laughs> uh, no, that's a, that's a, a really good question because um, I would say that we've been spending a lot of time over the last, it's, let me put it this way, first of all, it's about education. Um, it, it, like I said before, it, when you say you mortgage, people have a totally different, like there's a thousand meetings out there, and, but we're really spending a lot of time around education. We are, we are meeting with lenders, we are going to conferences, we're working with vendors, to do webinars, uh, to make sure that we're getting the word out and really trying to get people to understand the process, right? That, that's one. Two is, I think, to your point, over the last year or so, there's technology that's just been built out that enables this to be a much easier process. The hard part, though, like someone mentioned before, one is loan officers. You got you, you to make sure you have the right process. Uh, you got to have the right title agents. Like it has to be a, a complete ecosystem that comes to the table that allows you to follow that that process. Uh, but it it's going to be hard. Like I, like I said, I'm I don't think we're going to be waking up at the end of 2023 and we're all going to be fully digitized. But I, I feel like you know we're definitely um, hitting that point where I, I feel like we're we're about to take some really large leaps forward. Yeah, and, and, and like you said, I, I think, you know, 
if, if you, the positive thing that did come out of the pandemic, at least from the mortgage industry was, it really helped the mortgage industry accelerate or get over that hump uh, as far as uh, being able to really think about remote notarization. Right. Like, and you, you, see, um, you see the counties, the states, uh, you, you see legislation coming through now. Like these were all, I think, hurdles that were hard to overcome that have been paved, uh, you know, or, or removed, let me put it that way. But I, I, yeah, would yeah. you guys agree with that? Yeah, I think um, uh, like most things uh, that, that bring about change, dramatic change in industries, it's market disruption, right? Model T, carriages, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. And I think that's one of the thing, things about the pandemic um, that if you wanted to look for bright spots, kind of democratized, if you will, um, technology and the use of technology, remote. Um, I bet some of you guys are probably even hiring people remotely to in secondary, which would have been unheard of before. So I think we can, we've demonstrated, we've got the empirical evidence of 2020 and 2021 to, um, for change management agents within your organizations to be the ones to keep poking constantly. Can we change? A lot of times it's not us investors, right, that are the problem. A lot of times it's actually saying we're going to do it, we're going to spend money, we're going to test it, and we're willing to take a risk. Right, that's the, that's the difficulty in changing go. operations. <clears throat> so look on the bright side of life, to, to quote uh, you know? uh, Life of Brian. Um, and you guys will be here during lunch to sign autographs and ask, be, answer questions and so forth. But I wanted to thank our panelists, Phil, Amy, Pat, and Steve, <clears throat> for a great job. And uh, Chris, where's lunch? Uh, let's also thank Rob Chrisman, everybody. Uh,